We are on um, Revelation Part 3, Lesson 5 today. The part 3 of Revelation is about answering the questions of, that were, Jesus was asked of what is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. In Lesson 5, we were looking at specifically about the word tribulation. What can we learn about it? It's shown up a couple of times in our studies. And as we looked in Lesson 4, we were, for the first time, or first or second time, stepping outside of the book of Revelation for the first time in a long time. And as we were in, mainly in Matthew, and that is where those questions show up, at least for us, for the first time, that Jesus was asked. Now, we have on the board already um, a little bit of information. This is one of the first times I've ever put something up in advance of you coming. <laughs> we will go over it. But these are things that we've already established, mostly established through our study of Revelation Part 2 and our review in the first few lessons of Revelation Part 3. So let's go over what's up here. It'll be a good way to kind of review. We remember, as we've done our, over and over and over again our study, not everything in Revelation is up here. So we're going to have to remember what fills in the blanks, okay? So, But we know that there's a pivotal point in the book of Revelation um, not necessarily in the book of Revelation, I mean, as far as like naming chapter and verse, but what is the event or what is the moment or the time or this thing that we can set as the pivotal point from which we can either set time going forward or set time going back? Do you remember? The one thing in the book of Revelation. <laughs> this is supposed to be a good review. I've got it marked up here. <laughs> The seventh trumpet. Right. The end of the sixth trumpet, the beginning of the seventh trumpet. There are several phrases that are attached to the beginning of the seventh trumpet. We saw in chapter 10, it said, when the seventh angel is about to sound, the mystery of God is finished. That's one of your phrases to, to remember. Because it's not happening in chapter 10, but we see it happening when it is in chapter 11, the seventh trumpet sounding, but it's at the end of the sixth trumpet in this beginning of the seventh trumpet. So in those days when the seventh trumpet is about to sound. Also, when the seventh trumpet does sound, we have other phrases. Now the salvation of God and his Christ have come. Um, it's better said. That's just an abbreviation. We also have, and that was in chapter 11 of Revelation. In chapter 12 of Revelation, we have the two signs that John sees in heaven. One is of the woman, and one is of the great red dragon. Right? And there's an event that happens. There's some time phrases in chapter 11. There's some time phrases in chapter 12. But one of the events that happens in chapter 11 is the war in heaven. And who are the players in the war in heaven in chapter 12? Michael and his angels versus Satan and his angels. Satan is also the great red dragon. Satan, the devil, the deceiver of the world, I mean, that's where in Revelation 12, it tells us all those things. He is the um, serpent of old, taking you all the way back to the garden, to Genesis chapter 3. Okay, in your mind, as far as like what serpent of old is he talking about. That is the war in heaven. As a result of that war in heaven between Michael and his angels and the dragon and his angels, what happens? Satan is, down. Satan is cast down to earth and his angels. Right? There's no longer a place found for him there. And when he comes down to the earth, it says, you know, rejoice in heaven, woe to the earth. Why? Because when he comes down, he has great wrath. And he knows he has a short time. Right? Okay. That event, we believe, happens at the same time frame as the seventh trumpet. Okay? So it's marked here as well. Okay? So from that time forward, going forward in time. We've got, also we have after the seventh, seven trumpets, what comes out of the seventh trumpet are the seven bowls. Prior to the seventh trumpet, you have seven seals and six of the trumpets, right? The last three trumpets are also the three woes. Very good. Okay, so this is that pivotal point. Backwards, we don't know how far our time phrases cover those seven seals and the six trumpets, but we do know they are prior to the seventh trumpet. That's one thing we know. The other thing we know is at this seventh trumpet, at the end of the sixth trumpet, what is the major event in chapter 11? Remember, 11 has the two witnesses. So the two witnesses, what happens? 
to them. They are ultimately and they're, they're killed. But right at the end of the sixth process. trumpet, in the beginning of this, mm -hmm. at the right before the beginning, the two witnesses are killed by who? Uh, by who? The, beast. the beast. The beast that comes out of the abyss. Okay, mm -hmm. kills them. This is what we're told in eleven. That means the beast is on the scene prior to that. So the beast is on the scene somewhere back here. Not exactly sure when he starts, but we know he's there by the end of the sixth trumpet when the two witnesses are killed. And after three and a half days of lying in the streets, they are raised from the dead, breath of God comes back into them, and they're taken to heaven in front of all of their enemies are witnessing this, right? So that happens at the end of the sixth trumpet, right before the seventh trumpet. And we know their ministry, their prophesying year, time, is how long? 42 months, we're going to equate it to three and a half years, right? It doesn't call it three and a half years, but it's that same period of time, all right? Which is 1260 days or three and a half years or 42 months. That's what time phrases I have up there, okay? Again, I have an arrow over there because I don't know how much of the events of Revelation are covered in that three and a half years as far as the seals and the trump six trumpets are, but we do know they occur during that time. Okay, on this side though, in that after that pivotal point, you have in chapter twelve, you have the war in heaven and Satan cast down to earth. But you have the woman that was the other sign, and she flees to the mountains or flees to the wilderness for how long? Twelve hundred and sixty days, which is three and a half years. Okay, we do have an end point to that. That's the reason there's not an arrow on this side because there's an event that caps the end of that time, okay? And that's what we started to establish. What is the end event? Or is the event? Jesus returns. Jesus returns, chapter 19. Jesus comes on the white horse with his army, and there is a battle. And that battle we call the Battle of Armageddon, usually, because they were gathered at Armageddon, if you, know, if you remember. And it was the kings, of, and, and really... Every level of people, as far as down to slaves even, are gathered for this battle. And they had been gathered, and now they're there. And they come against Jesus, and they come against his army that's with him. What is the result of that battle? Um, it's not nice. It's not good. <laughs> not good at all. But who is, who is stopped? <laughs> the army. The army is killed. And the birds eat their flesh. And that's called the Great Supper of God. Okay? There are two people, two players. Something happens to them as a result of this war. The beast and the, beast. the, beast and the false prophet, and this is the very end of chapter 19, are cast into the lake of fire. So this is the LOF, the lake of fire. Um, and so the beast and false prophet are cast there alive. They're taken and they're thrown there. Okay, so that is the end event. That's the event that ends that three and a half year period. We know that. Okay, from that point forward, starting in chapter 20, we have the thrones that are set up in judgment. But we have a time phrase that's mentioned, I think it's like seven times in a few verses, something like that. What event, what time phrase is that? Thousand years. thousand years. What happens during that thousand years? We see Satan, at the beginning of it, is bound for that thousand years, right? But we also see the saints reign with Christ for a thousand years, right? Okay, so there's a thousand year reign. Obviously, there's, this is not to scale, because <laughs> that period of time is about the same length as that. But this is the thousand year reign. Okay, at the end of the thousand year reign, there's an event. Okay, at the end of the thousand year reign, Satan, 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 Satan is released. And so you've got Satan released, and he's able to, because he hasn't been able to deceive during that thousand years as part of his captivity, afterwards he's able to go and he's able to deceive, and then he does something else. What does he do? He gathers an army, he gathers an army and they come up against the, the camp of the saints, they come up against the city we believe would be Jerusalem. And what happens as a result? Fire comes down from heaven, devours the army, and what happens to Satan? He's cast into the lake of fire. Okay. Then after that, you have what we call the GWT, the Great White Throne. 
right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and don't forget, in, from in, when the great white throne and he who sits on it, from whose presence, from whom, whatever the right word there is, um, the earth and heaven pass away. They go away. So it's at that point there is no more old earth and old heaven when the great white throne happens. Okay? And don't forget, don't miss that phrase. <clears throat> As a result of the great white throne judgment, who comes before that great white throne? The Right. They're called the dead, Hades, death. Okay, the, and, and we know they're unsaved, all of them, because what is the outcome of their judgment? They're all, the dead are all cast into the lake of fire. So everyone that comes before the great white throne. And what is the designator, what are, what, where is their name not found? In the book of life. Okay, so there are books that are opened and a book that is opened. And so the book of, the li book of life is where they're not found, therefore as a result of the books and every uh, this judgment, they're cast into the lake of fire. Okay? So, and it says Satan is cast there where the beast and false prophet were. Mm -hmm. Okay? So these are the things that we've already established, mm -hmm. after which there's the new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. Those are the last few chapters, a couple of chapters of Revelation. Now, if you go way back here, I kind of have a break in my timeline because there's a lot of time passed. And we've established, obviously, Jesus' incarnation, the crucifixion, and his resurrection, because that's covered also in the book of Revelation, chapter 12. When it's talking about the woman who's pregnant, she gives birth to a male child, and that child is eventually caught up to God. That's the ascended to heaven part. We know that's Jesus, and we know he was crucified. Okay, so this is what we've established prior to uh, in Revelation. And then when we looked at Matthew last week, Matthew 23, end of it, and then 24, we also noticed that Jesus started talking about a major event. He says, there are going to be wars and rumors of wars. Don't be deceived. Don't be misled. They're going to say that if there's a Christ over here. Don't be misled. Remember, he kept warning them not to be misled. He's trying to, they've asked him the questions of, what is the sign of your coming? When will these things happen? He just mentioned the temple being destroyed. When they were looking at the temple buildings from a distance. And they said, he goes, there will be no stone left upon another. And they said, when will that happen? And then they said, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So he starts answering some of those questions through first talking about, in very general terms in Matthew 24, the first part. He says, don't be misled. He said there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, but he calls the wars and rumors of wars what? <clears throat> he said it's not yet the end. Those are birth pains. Okay? So <clears throat> those are birth pains. And then he says, he starts listing what's going to happen right before the end. Now, when you realize what Jesus is talking about is the end or the end of the age, remember they said the end of the age, the end of the age culminates in him returning. That's what he talks about, the coming of the Son of Man, right? In Matthew 24. But what is an event that he talks about prior to that that kind of starts a timeline? When you see what set up? Desolation. The abomination of desolation, standing in the holy place. Let the reader beware. And then he says, flee. Don't even go back into your homes. Don't go back after a coat. Run. Okay, he says, make sure, you know, pray that it not be on a Sabbath, or hope you have got to hope it's not on a Sabbath. You got to hope you're not pregnant or with young child. It's going to be hard. You have to hope that it's not in winter. Okay, so he's showing that this is not going to be easy. It's going to be a tough time. But he starts with the abomination of desolation, and then he talks about um, what he calls a great tribulation, and he says it's a time such as never been seen before and never will be again. And if the time had not been cut short, no one would survive. Even the elect would, would be killed. So, and well actually it says for the sake of the elect, he keeps it a short period of time. So we believe as we looked at that, this abomination of desolation lines up with our pivotal point. And from that point forward, you have the great tribulation, or a great. And that's what we looked at this week, is it just 
when you see the word tribulation in scripture, is it just talking about tribulation, a bad time, not a good thing? Or is it talking about a specific thing, like we would put a definite article, the? Right? Okay. And that's what we were looking at. We're putting it here. That's what we looked at last week. Starting with the abomination of desolation, there's a great tribulation. At the end of those days, immediately following, is the coming of the Son of Man. That's why it lines up with what we've already put in Revelation. Okay? On its own, we could not establish that from Matthew 24. But having looked at Revelation, having seen all of this established firmly after weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks of looking at Revelation, that was the beauty of what we did, then we can put this event, this great tribulation, happens right before the coming of Jesus, which is talked about in Revelation also. And it's talked about by Jesus in Matthew 24. And it talks about some events that happen here. The moon becomes black. The, or the sun becomes black, the moon has no light to shine. Stars fall from the heaven, and then they'll see the sign of the sun, coming of the Son of Man, and the earth will mourn, and then they're going to see the Son of Man coming on a cloud. So it's that same event. He's not coming a bunch of different times. It's the same event. That is the answer to the end of the age. When will that be? Well... When he, we didn't really address this too much, but Jesus kept saying, even in that part of Matthew, he, he talked about it in kind of the first part where he kind of gives an overview, and then he gives a little more detail, starting with the abomination of desolation. But he says again, they're going to say there's a Christ out in the wilderness. They're going to say, I'm in a, you know, he's the Son of Man is in the inner room. Don't be misled. Okay, how can they not be misled? Jesus gives them the way to not be misled. He tells them what it's going to be like when he returns, right? So if that hasn't happened, if the sun is not turned black and the moon has not lost its, its, its ability to shine and the stars have not fallen from heaven and the abomination of desolation hasn't happened yet and there hasn't been a time of tribulation such as never been seen before or ever will be seen again, then the event of Jesus' return hasn't happened. That's how you're not misled. Okay? I don't know about you, but years ago, when I was, I don't know, I was like fifth grade. I remember where we lived, so I can tell you I was in fifth grade. Whatever age that is, 10, 11, something like that. Mm -hmm. We watched a movie that some of you may have remembered, and it was called A Thief in the Night. Do you remember that movie? From years ago. And it, it was starting with an event that I had never even heard of before that we'll call, that is usually called the rapture. And then what the earth, what might be going on in the world as a result. So it was, it was a Christian movie. As a 10, 11 year old, whatever age I was, I was terrified because there's the idea of missing Jesus' return. What if? And this is what I thought, just so you know. I was young. <laughs> Still, but as an adult, this wasn't completely eradicated. But the idea of, what if Jesus walked up and talked to me, and I didn't recognize him? How am I supposed to recognize him? How would I know? And we've talked about it in here. We've had at least one event recent in recent years of a man who claimed to be Jesus, right? Waco, Texas? Was it Waco? Yeah, uh, correct. David Koresh. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was trying to think of it. It was in Texas. Um, David Koresh. He literally claimed to be Jesus. There's been others, but he's one that we all can remember and the Branch Davidians and the disaster of that whole thing and how um, that fire and the people that were killed and the things that came out as a result of that. How could those people have known he was not Jesus? In one place alone, they could have looked at Matthew 24. They could have understood a little bit about Revelation, but they certainly could have seen it in one chapter of the Bible. It didn't fit what the Bible says. But that just shows how easily people are deceived. Yes, it does show how easily people are deceived. And I remember hearing a statistic years ago, even before the Branch Davidian thing, most cults, and when I say cult, I mean a very specific religious sect of people who deny the, the deity of Christ is usually the, the idea of a cult or the strictest definition of a cult. But when you're talking about 
a deceived group of people. Most people that they're able to recruit are people that have been in church, that have a little bit of religion, but they don't have individual personalized knowledge. And, and again, I was one of those people, raised in church, comfortable with God. <laughs> I say that because it's just kind of a funny concept to me, looking back. But that's I was one of those people. Never had a problem with God, never doubted his, his existence. Didn't doubt the existence of Jesus. Didn't doubt anything I'd been told, not that I was told that much. I, was, I, was one of the, I would have been one of those vulnerable people. As a matter of fact, I can name a couple of books that I'm not real thrilled that I read, um, but you remember the movie, The Omen? Mm -hmm. Okay, I read the book at one point because I used to read a lot. I mean, I do still read, but I read a lot even back then. And within it, they put just enough Bible talk to make you believe that that could be the Antichrist. That way he had 666 on his head as a child, born of a jackal. He and it, they actually quoted something that sounded like it was biblical, that he was that this was all fulfilling scripture, and as a church person, I thought it was real. I thought, well, and of course, I knew it was fiction. I knew the book and the movie were fiction, but I thought they were taking real biblical text and making this story and making this case. That's how easy it is for somebody to do what I call God talk and talk you into something. If you don't be the Berean, if you don't, that is not, not grammatically correct. <laughs> if you're not the Berean and go back to Scripture and ask somebody, like, where is that? You know, and I will tell you, if you ask me where something is, I might have to say, give me a minute, I'll go look it up. I don't know every reference there is. Don't be intimidated by that. If you know what you're talking about, say, I'll get back with you and mean it. And, and try to start looking it up. But don't not say it because you can't give a reference is my point. Okay, so it's easy, but the way you aren't deceived is to know what it says. And what we're trying to do here, and what Kay has been doing in her videos, is trying to get us to what can we know. And if we can't, it's not up here. Like I said, there's an arrow point on this side. I could come in here and I could say, oh, I know when that time starts by this event then. But we don't know that from Revelation. So we're not, I'm not willing... And it says don't add anything and don't take anything away. I'm going to say what we can. We do know there's going to be seven seals. We do know there's going to be seven trumpets. And we do know there's going to be seven bowls. We do know what those events, as Revelation tells us, are going to be in those events. Now, I can't tell you what that locust thing is all about, except for what it says. And when it happens, there, we're going to go, oh, <laughs> it's exactly how it's described, but we couldn't figure it out has a tail sting like a locust, but has a face of a horse or whatever, breastplate on it, you know. And then there's some people that will adamantly tell you that's a cobra helicopter, you know. But they don't. They don't. It's a possibility. Mm -hmm. And again, when you get into a fictionalized account of how it might be, and we have the Left Behind series, Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins have done a very good job of trying to stay biblical, but it's fiction because they're having to flesh out, as I call it, the events and say this is how they're going to play out when they don't really know. And they added conversations and stuff like that because they're trying to use imagination and give people an idea of what is biblical. Okay, but you always have to suspend and go, maybe it'll happen that way. <laughs> Certainly, you don't even know if the names of those people will exist. But they're not trying to say it's absolutely, they're just saying, we're going to give you an illustration of what but the But for Bible many says. people, that could make them understand mm -hmm. that they need to get in the Word. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, because one so of the things... understand. What's yes, one of the things the books and the movie versions of, of some of it did do is show church people, like pastors, who were here after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I, and in that movie, so long ago, The Thief in the Night, I remember a scene where a young girl, or a teenage girl, a young girl was terrified one day because she came home and her parents weren't there, but they were just not in the house at the moment or didn't hear her or something and she was terrified that they had left and she wasn't she didn't which was actually a good possible salvation moment 
but there's a teenage girl, I believe, or a young 20s girl. And it's been a long time since I've seen the movie. And I remember the next Sunday she goes back to her church and it's full. Mm. Is that the one with Richard Burton? I don't think so, but I don't really know. It's been a long, long time since I've seen that. I mean, I was in fifth grade in the early 70s. So you can imagine the clothing style was really hysterical <laughs> too. Uh, I'd have to. I need to get that movie and watch it again. Yeah. See how accurate. Because I don't even know if it's that accurate. I'm just saying it raised an awareness of something I'd never heard of before, and it instilled fear—a good kind of fear, mm -hmm. the kind of fear that makes you say, "What if?" Like the Left Behind series. What if, if for a moment, let's believe it, would I stay or would I go? And do I want to face these things? That's what we're seeing in Revelation. We've said many times, do we want to be here? And if we are here, how are we going to act? Or are there people that we care about or people we don't care about that we don't want going? Do you want anybody to go through this? No. 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 Okay. So as we get into what we studied this week, as we looked at the word tribulation, I'm just going to ask you if you can kind of remember back before this week, if I had used the word tribulation, what would you have said? What would have been your answer to what you thought or have heard in the past about the tribulation? Time of testing. Time of testing, okay. Time of destruction for some people. Okay, time of destruction for some people. And when you say time, how much time? Three and a half years. You're saying three and a half years. Yeah. But most of the time when we say tribulation... What do we mean? Seven, seven, seven years. years. Seven years. Yeah. Okay. And it okay. So we're gonna we're gonna try to suspend and say, why am I only putting it here? Which is a three and a half year because period. The first three and a half years are peaceful. Doesn't the Antichrist promise that Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get there in a minute. There is a time of peace. Okay, you believe there's a time of peace and then Okay, but most of the time when you say tribulation, people are talking about the seven years. Are there seven years? Yes. Okay, and we saw that this week in what book of the Bible? Daniel. 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 But in Matthew, we've seen this part so far. Okay, but in Daniel, and it's in Daniel 9, and we have studied Daniel, but this week what we looked at, if this is the only time you've ever looked at these verses, there's no way you can completely and fully understand everything. But we're going to go through that last, essentially last paragraph or two, last paragraph of <coughs> Daniel 9, starting in verse 24. <coughs> this is, to put it in context, this is um, something that came to Daniel, was told to Daniel, right? So this is not Daniel interpreting someone else's vision as he's done in previous chapters of Daniel in previous times. In this case, Daniel is giving, given this um, message, this understanding. If you back up to verse 23, it says, At the beginning of your supplications, Daniel had been praying and fasting for a time, the command was issued, and I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. So give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. So the purpose of this next part is to tell Daniel some things and explain them to him. And let me just ask you real quickly, because you've done this, how easy was this to understand? <laughs> not. Not very. Not everything. But we're going to break down what we can know and what is told. Okay? So number one, it says in verse 24, what has been decreed? 70 weeks. 70 weeks. Okay, I say to you 70 weeks, what are you immediately going to think? 70 times what number? Seven days is what we would say. A week is seven days, right? Even in the Jewish calendar, a week is seven days. But this word week just means sevens. Seven periods of time, right? So we're talking 77 periods of time, okay? Now, <clears throat> because we have looked at this, you looked at it this week, we looked at it when we studied Daniel as well, we have to ask ourselves, we, they would not have known when Daniel was given this, what period of time seven times 70 was, okay? But from history and time, we know this was not fulfilled in 70 times seven days, 490 days. It was not fulfilled during that time, any of this, right? It was not fulfilled in 490 seven-day period weeks, right? It was not fulfilled in 490 
months, right? But a portion of this was fulfilled in 483 years. Okay, why do I say 483 instead of 490? Because if you read on, it says, in verse 25, it says, You're to know and discern her from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince were seven weeks and 62 weeks. Okay, so of the 70, how many weeks are going to be fulfilled by the, that period of time? Seven and 62 is 69. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so, and when it says, let's go on and read just a little bit more. It said, it will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. And then after the 62 weeks, now it's not saying 62 of the 69, it's saying there's 7 and then 62. So after that second 62, there is Messiah the Prince will be cut off. Okay, historically, what event is that? The crucifixion of Christ. Okay, so on our timeline up here, where we have the crucifixion, right here, you go backwards, it's 62, mm -hmm. and then there's 7. And I'm not going to put an arrow, I'm going to put a, 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 from 7 plus 62, and that's um, times 7. <laughs> so that's 483 years. It's easy to remember because it's easy to take one seven out of 490. It's easier than multiplying 69 times seven. <laughs> okay, so if you, if you have the total of 490 and you take one seven year period out of it, 483 is easier to remember that way. So from the time of Christ's crucifixion, when Messiah is cut off, that's what Daniel is saying here. Messiah is cut off. If you go backwards in time, you have... 7 plus 62, which is 69 times 7, 483 years. And so the event here is from the decree to, and this is Messiah, cut off. And you can reference this to Daniel 9.25. That period of time happened. The decree, though, is important because it says from the decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. Because if you go back to the Persian Empire, Medo-Persian Empire, there were three decrees. One of them was to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. One of them was to rebuild the temple. Okay, It's not the one for the temple. It's one to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. And that um, decree, see if I have it written down, I think I have the date for that written down in my Bible. But that when that happened, when when you take a 360-day Jewish calendar year and multiply by 483 years, and they know historically when this decree was done, the day you come to is Palm Sunday. Hmm. What we call Palm Sunday, the original Palm Sunday. But it says, until Messiah... Until because it says sorry because it says here from the decree until Messiah the Prince Palm Sunday was the first time people recognized Jesus for who he was publicly remember they cried out Hosanna mm -hmm. and he came riding in to town on a donkey a humble prince but he came riding in not a conquering prince that time but it says from the seven years to the sixty two years there's going to be, it, it is going to be rebuilt, talking about Jerusalem, with plaza and moat. Not sure what that meant, but still, that's what it says. And then it says, then after that 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. Right? That's the crucifixion. Now we know he rose and ascended to heaven. It's not talking about that here. But that still, we do know he was cut off, and that would be the crucifixion. Okay. But it's only talking about so far, 69 of the 70 total weeks, right? That's how we can know this is years. Because from that decree to Messiah the Prince, when Jesus was uh, declared the Prince, 483 years passed. So now we know that the weeks represent seven years each. Then you have to multiply it out by the 
62 or the 7 or the total of 70. Right? Okay. How clear is that? Are you following or have I just totally confused you? Because <laughs> I'm trying to clear things up and not make it worse. Okay. So, but we're trying to dissect this a little bit. So let's look further in verse 26. It, after it talks about the 62 weeks and Messiah cut off, it says, the people, and that's what's so important here, when she asked you to list on your chart the people that were being described, it says the people of the prince who is to come. It's easy to focus on the prince who is to come part, but it says the people of the prince who is to come will, be de will destroy the city and the sanctuary. City, what city are we talking about? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Keep it in context. It's talking about city is Jerusalem. And the city and the sanctuary will be destroyed. Its end will come with a flood. Even to the end there will be war. Desolations are determined. Okay. So when in context of Messiah being cut off after the 62 plus the 7 weeks period, the 483 years, we've got Messiah the Prince, we have Messiah cut off, and then the, there's a group of people that will destroy the city. When did that happen in time and history? You got the 70 part, right? <laughs> 70 A.D. 70 A.D. Okay, so okay. this would be around 33-ish A.D. But on 70 A.D., a short time after this, if we want to go in time, at 70 A.D., you have General Titus. And I've got it right here in front of me. <laughs> General Titus, we know historically General Titus came and he destroyed the city and he destroyed the temple. So when Jesus is at about 33 A.D., just prior to the crucifixion in Matthew 24, that final week of his life, seven-day period week of his life, prior to his crucifixion, that last few days, Jesus leaves the temple and he says, these stones are not going to be left upon each other. And they said, when will that happen? And he doesn't really answer that question directly in chapter 24 of Matthew. But we know it happened in 70 A.D., and so even now, if you were to journey to Jerusalem and you were to go to what they call the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall, where many Jews go and pray over and over and, and put their prayers even in the crevices, there are huge stones there. One has been not left upon another. And we historically know what happened. And that's 70 AD with General Titus. Okay, so that's what's talked about here that Daniel's being told about. Okay? Okay. Um, but let's focus on who he says does this. Who does this? The people. The people are, at that time we know historically, Roman, right? So the, the people are Roman. And we're talking about the Roman Empire that was ruling and reigning over most of that part of the world when Jesus was walking around, when Jesus was crucified, and in 70 AD. So the people are Roman, okay? General Titus in particular is the general, but the people are Roman. Now, when you look at Daniel's other vision that we looked at this week, he had a, a vision of four beasts, right? We're told, we're not going to go into detail about those beasts, but we're told, we're looking, you look this week at the fourth beast, the dreadful and terrifying beast. The other beasts are described as animals with unusual characteristics like too many heads and wings and things like that. But there's a lion. What beast does that, what what beast, the lion, what kingdom does he represent? Babylon. Babylon, the one that Daniel is in at the time Daniel's writing this, this prophecy down, right? That's Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar in particular, Babylon the kingdom. The next kingdom is the... Um, is the bear with leaning up on one side and the stuff in his mouth. And that's the Medo-Persian Empire. One side, the, it, it, we believe that the indication of the bear being uh, up on one side is that one part or one arm was stronger than the other in the Medo-Persian Empire. And so that was the kingdom that came and took over the Babylonian Empire, the next kingdom that came along. We also see this in the statue that Daniel saw in chapter 2. Okay, the third kingdom is represented by a leopard, very swift animal with four wings, four heads and wings and all this other stuff. And we know that to be 
Alexander the Great in particular, and Greece is the is the kingdom and the empire. So we're told, not that we figured this out, but Daniel is told those four beasts represent four kingdoms. We're never told in the book of Daniel, but we know from history what was the next kingdom that came after the Greek empire that took over. Rome. Rome. Okay, and remember, all of these beasts, all of the visions that Daniel are given are pertaining to Daniel's people. So we have to understand it's not just some remote stuff happening like here in the United States at the same time because we did not directly impact Israel. Okay, we may now, but we didn't then during Daniel's time. So we're talking about the events. These are all, almost all events that happened after Daniel's death. So he's told this in advance. But we know it's the fourth kingdom is the Roman Empire. That would be the fourth kingdom, which would be the toes and the, the feet of the statue of Daniel 2. Also, that's how it would relate. But when you go to Daniel 9 and you see this prophecy, he's saying the people of the prince who is to come. So whatever is going on here is not by that prince. I'm talking about in time, 70 AD. But the people are... So the people of the prince who is to come in this prophecy by Daniel, from Daniel, or to Daniel, I should say, um, are the Roman people. We can nail that down. Partly because of what Daniel says and partly because we have history on our side. This has been fulfilled. Some of this has been fulfilled. So when it says the people who, of the prince who is to come, remember prince who is to come and remember who his people are. And it says they will destroy the city. And then in verse 27 it says, and he... The only he we can refer back to is who? Media context. The prince who is to come. Okay? He's, it's very difficult for me to say this because I'm jumping in time. But when Daniel's talking about this, he's in the Babylonian Empire. He's talking about future events. But he's talking about a people that we've established are the Romans. And from the Romans are going to come a prince. Now in 27 we're shifting and it's saying he, that prince who is to come. Not a prince during that time, but a prince who is to come, coming out of the what group of people? Romans. The Romans. He. And not just Italy. Right. Not Rome, Italy, the city, but the Roman Empire. Okay, that people group. He, a prince who is to come, will make a firm covenant with the many. The many would be referring to Jews. Mm -hmm. Well, he'll make a firm covenant with the many for how long? Mm -hmm. One week. Remember, we've already established this word week means sevens, and we only have one of those left. We've already used up 69 of them. Okay? So there's one week that's still yet left. And we know that period of time is how long? Seven years. Seven years. Okay, so there is going to be a period of time of seven years where a firm covenant with the many will be made in the middle of that week. So how long would that be? Three and a half, three and a half years. At the three and a half mid-year point, what's he going to do? Stop the sacrifice and bring on. Okay, that's going to be right here. The prince who is... To come, and I will put Roman in parentheses, will put, he'll stop sacrifice and grain offering. Okay? Now that's right in the middle of a seven year period. So there's three and a half years this way, and there's three and a half years that way. And that is one week from Daniel chapter 9. That whole time period is one week for a seven-year period. There is a covenant. Okay, I'm putting it here, but it's this whole period of time. There's a covenant, so you actually, I guess we should do that. There's a covenant made for a seven year period by this prince who is to come. He makes the covenant here. So if you want to write that, however you want to write that up there. He makes a covenant, a firm covenant. Now a covenant is, even by definition of the word, not to be broken. Death is the result if you break a covenant, should be, that isn't always, but should be. 
but he makes a firm covenant with, I'm going to say the Jews, with a mini for a seven year period, and in the middle, at the three and a half year point, he puts a stop to sacrifice and grain the offerings. What does that tell you is going on? If he puts a stop to it, what's been going on? And they have been worshiping. The they had been, the Jews uh -huh. had been worshiping with sacrifices and grain offerings. Uh -huh. What tells you has to be a, a, temple. a temple has to be in place. Uh -huh. There has to be a temple at least during this period of time because he puts a stop to sacrifices and grain offerings. The Jewish sacrifices and grain offerings. Okay? So there has to be a temple. We you know we've said over here, there has to be a beast over here. We've already said that up there. There has to be a temple during this period of time. When it starts, I don't know, but there has to be one for there to be a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. It goes on, and it says, On the wing of abomination will come one who makes desolate. So we now still have this idea of the abomination and of desolation, whether it's saying that exact same thing. And then it says, <coughs> Even until a complete destruction... One that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. It's a very difficult thing to follow. But it's saying there is something that's already decreed. The thing that's going to happen is the one who has made desolate, the one we're calling the one who makes desolate, comes to an end. Okay? Now, we've already talked about an abomination of desolation. We already talked about this time period ending with when Christ returns. Who is destroyed when Christ returns? The beast and the false prophet. Could this beast be the one who makes desolate? Because his end is decreed. That's a little bit, I'm just putting the ideas, I'm not going to put it up here at this moment. But we've already seen an abomination of desolation. Okay, now we've got to jump to Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians. We looked at that this week, didn't we? Say something. Is it second or first? Second. 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 Sorry. See, I'm just testing. See if you're paying attention. Okay. Second Thessalonians chapter two. Um, and this is where we start putting pieces together because we have some things established. Okay. So let's just read. The problem here that Paul is addressing, because Paul is writing this to the group of the Thessal at Thessalonica, is they've become concerned. Part of what they've been kind of concerned about is somebody's been telling them that Jesus has already come back. Okay, Remember what Jesus tells them in Matthew 24, which would have timeline, time frame been before Paul writes this. Because remember, Paul's ministry is after Jesus' ascension. Okay, So sometime after Jesus' ascension, sometime that when Paul writes this, there has been some group that has come around and started saying, Jesus has already come back. That would cause them concern. Would it cause you concern? Why would it cause you concern? Because it make you wonder if you missed it. If something. you missed it, right? So they they are they're understandably upset. And Paul is saying, with regard to the coming of our Lord in Christ and our gathering together with Him, he requests that you don't be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed by either a spirit or a message or a letter as if it's coming from us, meaning Paul and his group, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Okay, so he's worried. They're worried. The day of the Lord has already come. Okay, so he's addressing this, and he says, let no one in any way deceive you. Does that sound like what Jesus told them? Okay, he said, for you will, for it, sorry, it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Now, these are new terms for what we've talked about. We don't know exactly yet who this is. But Paul is telling them, the, before Jesus' return, what has to happen? He's listed it. What has to happen? Some, some things have to happen. They're listed right there. I just read them. <laughs> what did you say? The apostasy. The apostasy. Okay, sometime before this, you've got to have an apostasy. <coughs> and what else? The man of lawlessness. The man of lawlessness is revealed. I'm abbreviating that as M O L. The man of lawlessness is revealed, and he's also called the son 
of destruction. Okay. Now there's no time frame given except that this has to happen prior to Jesus' return. The day of the Lord, Jesus' return. So there has to be an apostasy. There has to be a man of lawlessness revealed, the son of destruction. Then he tells us more about the son of destruction. What does it tell us? <coughs> Yes, he opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. Every one. That's very significant. What does he do in particular? Displays himself. He displays himself by, as God where? In the, in the temple. It says he takes his seat in the temple of God, not any temple, the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Okay, so there's something that happens that's huge. Number one, there has to be a temple. That's another thing. There has to be a temple during this period of time. Right? Mm -hmm. Because he walks in, he seats himself there, and he displays himself as being God. What might you call that that's on our board? Would that not be the abomination of desolation? Okay, so if that is the point where this he displays himself as God, and he seats himself in the temple, this man of lawlessness, okay? And then it says, do you remember it? Well, while I was with you, I was telling you these things, and you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he may be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Now, Paul's talking way back. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. This is not absolutely known what this means, but there is a restraint. We know there's a restraint, right? Because this um, law, mystery of lawlessness. Then it says, when the lawless one, and that's the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Now we know exactly who this is. Who would we call? Well, Jesus is, right, the Lord. And Jesus slays him with the breath of his mouth. We're, what are we talking about up here? We're talking about when he comes and there is the battle of Armageddon, who does he slay with his, the breath of his mouth? That army that comes against him. Who in particular would we call the man of lawlessness? The beast. The beast. The beast. So the man of lawlessness is this beast. He is destroyed. He is destroyed by Jesus at the event, at the, at the coming of Christ. So we know what his end is. And it will, be, it will happen in this verse 8. It says, he'll bring to an end at the appearance of his coming. And that is, the one who's coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. That should take you back to Revelation chapter 13, when we see, after 12, let's start with 12, when we see the war in heaven, Satan cast down, he has great wrath, he only has a short time, he goes after the woman. The woman flees to the wilderness. When, he, when the earth even helps the woman, Satan turns and goes after the others. He goes after the offspring, other offspring of the woman, the one who holds the testimony of Jesus. And then you go into chapter 13 and you've got, the, you've got Satan or the dragon standing on the seashore watching the beast, first beast, come out of the water. And then we start hearing the description of the beast. And we see that he's given authority for 42 months. He's got blasphemous names. His authority comes from who? From whom? Satan. Satan. Satan gives him his throne, his authority, and all of his power. And that's exactly what this says here. So this man of lawlessness is the beast of Revelation. He's also called the son of destruction. He has to be revealed prior to Christ's coming. What does that mean? We recognize him, or they recognize him, or he outs himself, as we might call it. What's the major event where there's absolutely no doubt when he walks into the temple, takes his seat, and displays himself as being God? Right? And then his destruction 
and his end comes when the with the breath of Christ at Christ's coming happens. Okay? So we're interested in these things to put them on our timeline. Let's put ourselves back in Thessalonica. They've been told Jesus has already come. And Paul is saying, no, don't you remember? I've told you some of these things already. Aren't you glad that Paul wasn't there and had to write them down? Because what he told them verbally, we get to read. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have known it otherwise. Not in this way. God would have revealed it however he wanted to. But this is the way God chose to reveal it. We have these events. And then it says, And with all the deception, sorry, verse 10, And all the deception and wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. So these are unsaved people. For this reason, God will send on them a deluding influence so that they might believe what is false, in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but, look, but took pleasure in wickedness. Okay, now notice how he says they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved and for that reason, for that reason, God sent a deluding influence. So they have the simplicity of the truth of the message. What message would that be? What's the simplest message there is of love? Jesus, Jesus, the gospel, absolutely. They didn't receive that, and so especially during this time, God's going to send that deluding influence. Now remember in Revelation how it keeps saying over and over again, they did not repent of their deeds and so as to stop idol worship or whatever else. They're described, the, those who dwell on the earth are obviously not written in the book of life, and they go into the lake of fire eventually, but... Over and over and over, there's this, they follow after the beast, or they are participating in killing people. You know, there's just all we can say about them and describe, but we see them here in Second Thessalonians as well. So, as we're looking at what we can know, the only time that's mentioned as tribulation or great tribulation is what? Is it the full seven years? It's only the last three and a half that are called the Great Tribulation. But we can know that this entire seven-year period is part of it. It's involved. We know we've got three and a half years going this way from the seventh trumpet. We've got three and a half years going that way from the seventh trumpet. So we know that's that same seven years that is mentioned as the firm covenant, the, the one week of Daniel's prophecy that has yet to be fulfilled. So you have... We also know a couple other things from Daniel is the, the prince who is to come is going to come from what kingdom? Roman. The Roman, Roman Empire. Empire. At least the Roman Empire as it was back then, not necessarily Rome, the city, let's say, of now. When we look at it, you'd have to go back and find somebody that has a map that shows how far the Roman Empire's influence was, and the prince who is to come could come from any of that. You probably do have a map in your Bible somewhere. But we know, I mean, just a little bit of history that I know, Hadrian's Wall in England that's built, I've never been there, I've seen pictures, was built by the Romans. The Romans got as far as Great Britain in their reach. Could we possibly be part of that? Our heritage? A lot of us come from the British Isles, right? Not all of us, but... Our America kind of started with that. Of course, we're a, 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 a melting pot, thank goodness. But would it include, let's say, Russia? Would it include China? Would it, you'd have to go back and look at an old map and to see. Well, it doesn't mean that he actually lives there. It could be, it could be heritage wise. Heritage -wise. Yeah. yeah. Possibly. Possibly. Because we don't know. But we do, what we do know is. It was the people were the Romans, the people of the prince who is to come. Now, could it mean that there will be a revised Roman Empire during this time? That could possibly be. We don't know. That it would be so obvious that he comes from that group. We know the beast who's killed here, we know some things about him from Revelation. He will have a kingdom, remember? Mm -hmm. And the beast that's described as the great dragon that the woman is riding on, there'll be ten kings 
And those ten kings, one is the only purpose is to give their power. They have power for a short time, an hour, and they give their power to the beast. And remember, then they turn on the woman, Babylon, and destroy her. And then we see the destruction of Babylon. So there's interconnection with a lot of, of what's going to be gone, going on in the world. Some of it are specific geographic locations. And some of it are more um, kingdoms and maybe not boundaries. Because those kings are not given a kingdom, but they're given power as kings. It's kind of an interesting thing. It's going to be one of those things that when it happens, we go, oh, <laughs> that's how it happens. Okay, so I'm not saying that we are wrong to talk about this as a time of tribulation. But to, to describe it as the great tribulation, I think we can only put it in that last three and a half years, possibly. Because, and, and where in Revelation... <laughs> What group of people come out of the Great Tribulation? Do you remember? The saints. You've got the, the, you've got the 144,000, and then you have a group called the... The ones that are sleeping. No, that's the souls under the altar. Mm -hmm. That's in this fifth seal mm -hmm. of chapter 6. So if we turn the page and go to chapter 7, where we first see the 144,000 mentioned, and those are the 12,000 from 12 tribes. The next mm -hmm. group is called the Great Multitude. Mm -hmm. Remember? Mm -hmm. And they're from every people, every tribe, every nation, and every tongue. And they're seen by John in that moment in heaven. So what do we know about them? They're believers. They're saved. They would be in the Lamb's Book of Life. And we know that they come out of it. It's the one time that it's mentioned in Revelation. They come out of the Great Tribulation. So we know they come out of this period of time. So what can you know about people during this period of time. Some get saved. And they're saved people, and they're killed during that period of time. They're part of the great multitude. We also see the souls under the altar who are crying out, how long, O oh Lord, are you going to refrain from avenging us? They say it a little differently, but that's essentially it. We see that group, but the great multitude comes out of this time frame. So have you ever had someone pastor, possibly, give a message on Revelation and say, no one gets saved during that period of time. I have. And there's very simple phrases in the book of Revelation that disprove that. Are they only, because we've talked about the 144, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my Bible page. <laughs> we talk about the 144,000, which are specifically from what group of people? The Jews, right? But they're sealed. And then we see them in chapter 14, where? In 7, we see them on earth. In 14, we see the 144,000 in heaven with Jesus. So what do we know about those 144,000? They're saved. They're Jewish saved people with Jesus in chapter 14. They've also been purchased from the earth, um, which they're purchased by Jesus' blood. And that would possibly be part of, I mean, yes, I would, what we would call the remnant of Jews. Um, sometimes we talk about the remnant of Christians, too. But, um, but I had to go back and look specifically at the great multitude because I wanted to see, is that only Jews? No. It's from every tribe, every nation, and every tongue. So worldwide, great multitude, or from all of the world, great multitude coming out of that three and a half year period of time, but killed. But 144,000 is not that many. In the world's population, 144,000 really is a drop in the bucket. Right. Mm -hmm. so. But that's And that's a specific group of Jews. That doesn't mean it's all of the ones mm -hmm. that get saved. It's from that oh, specific okay. group of heritage of those 12 tribes that are mentioned, 12,000 each, mm -hmm. and they're sealed. But it also says they refrain from defiling themselves with women. So this is a group of men. Okay? That doesn't mean no Jewish women are getting saved. It means that no Jewish women are of the 144,000. I mean, you just have to take it literally, because that's what it says. Okay? Um, but what might their message have been? If they're with Jesus later and they sing a song to Jesus and the Lamb, you know, as the Lamb, then they're probably, it doesn't say it specifically, but they're probably on earth when they are, you know, after their sealing and everything, proclaiming the message of, of Jesus. Along with who else is prophesying and teaching? <coughs> the two witnesses. Mm -hmm. During their prophecy and ministry and doing signs and wonders. You, gotta, you do have a pretty good group of people on earth 
that are speaking the truth during this time. But we see this idea in 2 Thessalonians of a restraint that's on the man of lawlessness until that restraint is removed. And there's a lot of speculation as to what that might be. It doesn't tell us, does it? So you notice I'm not telling you what that is because I have ideas. But what is that? And so there's people that will give you hard and fast, oh, that's exactly what this means. It doesn't say it. So mm -hmm. let's be careful. But there is a restraint. Do we know that? Add to or take away from. Yeah, don't add to or take away from. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to die on that hill. And I certainly don't want to have to stand before God. And But I, I, there will be times when I'll say, maybe that's what this means. You'll hear that and, and hear me qualifying it that way. But what can we know? We can know that there is a covenant made for one week, which is a seven-year period. We can know in the middle of that, which would be the three-and-a-half-year point, what there's a big event. The, the prince of the people who is to come, the man of lawlessness, as he's called in, in uh, man of lawlessness, walks into the temple, takes his seat there, and displays himself as being God. But it seems to indicate that even prior to that, he's exalting himself above every God, so much so that he goes into the temple of God and displays himself as being God. Number one, we know there's a temple. We know there's sacrifices and grain offers going on. So there's temple worship going on. If there's a firm covenant made with the many for a week, and there's a temple during that time, and temple service during that time, normal worship of the temple during that time, the covenant that's made with the many is made with the Jews. They're comfortable, in, an ess in essence, with this firm covenant that's been made. And he keeps that covenant till the three-and-a-half-year point, and then he walks and displays himself as being God. That would be the abomination of desolation. If anybody walked into the temple of God at any time in history and said, I am God, notice Jesus didn't even do that. And he was. Is. <laughs> but he was carried in to the courtyard. Who only went into the holy place? In the, the inner the priest did, and then the inner, inner place, the Holy of Holies, only the high priest once a year. So even during Jesus' day when there was a temple in, that, in his earthly ministry, he was taken there, carried in, at eight days old for his circumcision and his dedication. I'm not, no, I'm not sure about circumcision, but his dedication. He was recognized by the prophetess Anna and by Simeon. Simeon, yeah. I just have a, there's a picture of him lifting him up. He was recognized because they had made, a promise had been made to Simeon. And they recognized him. But then later, he's there as a 12-year-old. I think it says 12. He was there as a young child with his parents and stays in the temple area. But he's not a priest. I mean, yes, he is. But from an earthly perspective, he was not a priest that went into the holy place. And certainly not in the holy of holies. But he was in the temple area, the court area and all. He would have gone there. And then, as we saw in Matthew 24, he was there, and he was there every day teaching. And then he walks out. But what does he say at the end of chapter 23? He says, I'm going to leave this house desolate. God had been back at the temple. And God walked out. And then they crucified him. That particular temple that was rebuilt after the Babylonian exile of Daniel, that particular temple never had the Shekinah glory come to it like had been in the temple of Solomon mm -hmm. that so consumed the temple that all the priests had to leave because nobody could stay inside it. And then the Shekinah glory stayed over the temple, a visual reminder of God at his earthly, he confined himself to that. We didn't, you know, he could be everywhere and was, but there was a visual picture of the glory of God at the temple until, if you read Ezekiel, and we studied Ezekiel, that lifted, went to the eastern gate, and left. Never has returned until Jesus was carried in. God went back to his temple. And then, that temple was destroyed. Do we have a temple now? No. no. Will there be a temple? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if someone were to tell you Jesus has already come, what would you say? No. Mm -hmm. Because these things haven't happened. 
right? Now, when the 70 AD happened, that was horrible. That was desolation. That was destruction, right? As Daniel described it, destruction, right? But it wasn't someone walking into the temple and displaying himself as God. But do you realize there's an event prior to this time frame, prior to the incarnation of Christ, that was an abomination of desolation? That's, that's kind of the precursor in the picture in the image. And that was done by a man named Antiochus Epiphanes, or Antiochus, but I think it's Antiochus Epiphanes, right? And he hated the Jews. What did he do? Do you remember historically the events? We studied them again. He slaughtered a pig on the altar of God, and he set up a statue of Zeus in the temple. That was an abomination of desolation. It led to the inter-testament uh, te events. In other words, but after the last book of the Bible, of the Old Testament was written and before Jesus' incarnation in Matthew, the book of Matthew, in that period of time, there were some historic events that happened, like the Maccabees, the Maccabean Revolt. Mm -hmm. And for a short period of time, Jerusalem was taken back by the Jews from having, since Daniel's time, having been occupied and prior to Jesus' coming being occupied for a very short period of time, they had the temple. And do you know what is celebrated even to today in December that is a celebration of them taking back the temple and cleansing the temple? Hanukkah. And it's the Festival of Lights. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's because there had been this abomination happen and they wanted to cleanse the temple. And I put it sorry, back there. Um, back prior to Jesus' coming. So they have a picture in their mind. When Je but remember, that happened back here, somewhere. And that was Antiochus. Antiochus. Antiochus Epiphany. I've got the day written down. It's a long time ago. <coughs> I, I, I've got it written down in my, my Daniel somewhere. Um, we looked at, well, we looked at the chat Daniel 11 a little bit this week, right? Where we were looking at those events that we believe have happened and some that haven't, ha haven't happened. So if you've got Daniel back here talking about a future abomination of death, desolation, he talked about this one. But if you look at chapter 12 of Daniel, he talks again about an abomination of desolation, just like Jesus talked about abomination of desolation. It's, it's important kind of confusing, but it's somewhat important to understand that Jesus here is talking about a future abomination of desolation, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Okay, would Jesus be, because he says, Jesus says the abomination of desolation talked about by Daniel. Is he talking about that one? Mm -hmm. He's talking about one that's coming. There's another abomination of desolation that's going to happen. Okay, if you were a Jewish man sitting there knowing your Jewish history and you heard Jesus talking about an abomination of desolation, you would think it would remind you of this one. And you would say, what happened then? The temple was defiled and that was what made, it was an abomination what was happening and what was done. So you know there's an event that happened that you can think about from history that when you project it forward, you have an idea of what's going to happen. Paul would have known that too. Paul was a Jewish scholar, very educated man. So when he's talking to the Thessal people of Thessalonica that we just read in Thessalonians, he's talking about something that happened after this. No, he's talking after this to a group of people about a future event. Why do I point that out? Because there is a lot of teaching out there, and there are a lot of people out there that say this is the abomination of desolation that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24. And we're going to look in the future, we're going to look in future lessons, maybe even next week, week I'm not sure, and we're going to see is that when that happened? Did Jesus talk about the 70 AD event? He has already talked about it in Matthew 24 when he said, "No stone will be left upon another." But he doesn't call that an abomination of desolation. But he does talk about an abomination of desolation. He talks about it as something that's going to start this period of time that's the worst time ever and had to be cut short. 
or everyone would be killed. Could Jesus have been talking about this? They might have thought it when it happened. If you were sitting there and Jesus was saying, no stone's going to be left off on another, and you ask the questions, when's that going to happen? And what is the sign of the coming of the end of your age? And then you read the rest of what Jesus says, and he says, wars, rumors of wars, many are going to be misled, many are going to come saying, I am the Christ, and then there's going to be an end, and, and then he starts talking about an abomination of desolation. Okay, you're sitting back here in 33 AD, and 70 AD comes along, and the temple's destroyed, and the city's destroyed. You might say... Oh, that's what he was talking about. But nowhere in what General Titus did did he go into the temple and display himself as God. He did not go in the temple and set up a God like had been done by Antiochus Epiphanes. There was no slaughtering of pig or anything like that. He just destroyed everything. That in and of itself was bad. But it wasn't an abomination of desolation. But I've had people tell me this happened, what, um, John, what Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, happened here. So what happened? What, when Jesus said in Matthew 24, there's going to be an abomination of desolation. There's going to be a great tribulation. There was a bad time, and that dispersed the Jews. That was a bad time. But what did Jesus say was going to immediately follow the days of the great tribulation? His coming. Okay, and he said it had to be a short time. God shortened it or no one would survive. He didn't say how much time, he just said a short time. We're putting it here because it fits what we've seen. Because the end of it, Jesus said, was the coming of the Son of Man. Did that happen here? No. Some period after this? No. no. We're still waiting on it. Do you understand why people could get misled? If you were a Jew and you were living during the Holocaust, might you think that was the worst time ever in the history of the world? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've even had people tell me there's no way, knowing what we know about the Holocaust, that I could ever tell a Jew there's a worse time coming. Mm -hmm. Should we tell them there's a worse time coming? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because there's a worse time coming. It's the time of Jacob's distress. Daniel chapter 12 talks about an abomination of desolation that's going to happen. It talks about it in chapter 12 verse 11. From the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1290 days. That's a little bit longer than the 1260 we've been told. But he talks about an abomination of desolation that's set up and then he talks about when that happens, it's something that Daniel talks about a 9, which is the sacrifice and grain offering stopping. So now we've got from 12 to 9, we have this tied down also. But he's saying from that point, there's going to be 1260, 1290 days. So there's an extra 30 days. Then he gets real confusing. How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1335 days. Okay, that's not an additional 1335. That's actually an additional 45 days. So there's an additional 30 days, and then there's an additional 45 days. Doesn't explain exactly, but it's a blessing if you attain to this. But we do know there's some things that happen right in here, don't we? After Jesus' return, Revelation tells us thrones are set up. And more thrones. And those that sit on it are going to judge the nations. Right? We're going to see more about that. That might be some of what goes on in here during that period of time. As the thousand year reign starts in. And then it says, You go your way, Daniel, till to the end. Then you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. So Daniel's told he's going to die before this stuff happens but you will rise again for your appointed portion at the end of the age. Okay. Not sure we covered absolutely everything we covered this week, but we've got stuff up on our board. Does that tie it together for you better? Did you see this for yourself? It does good, Sandy. Um,
somewhat. A little bit. Yeah. A little bit, yeah. I tried yeah. not to confuse you further, <laughs> but to possibly nail some of this down. And you know I am very cautious about not putting anything up here unless we know it. How can we know it? Go ahead. There's just so much information. There is. Mm -hmm. There is so much. Trying to put it into some order in, in your head, it's, it's difficult. It is difficult. I agree. There's some things that just jump out at you and you see you Feel pretty good about it. Mm -hmm. Right. And I know at the end of Revelation Part 2, we didn't necessarily nail as much down as we're doing now. But do you see the beauty of having gone through those 12 weeks of going through Revelation that deep and over and over and repeat and repeat? And then even as we started Part 3, you had to go back through those chapters again and be reminded yet again. And now we can say these things. Now I can put some of this on the board before you even walk in the door. And we're there together. Okay? It's, it's difficult, and I've been through this so many times, but when I finally got this whole abomination of desolation mentioned more than once down in my brain, I now, I still stumble, but I now have the ability to talk to somebody who says, for instance, that this has already fulfilled what Jesus talked about in Matthew 24 of the abomination of desolation. It's like when Jesus is saying, don't be misled. It's like when Paul is saying, don't be misled. If you know these major facts and they haven't happened, then it can't have been fulfilled. God doesn't give, con well, he gives confusion sometimes. He doesn't really give confusion. We're confused, but God doesn't tell us things and say, oh, I'm not going to do it that way so that I confuse you. He gives us details for a reason. And he says you're not a real prophet, which would mean Daniel's not a prophet or whoever's not a prophet, if what I gave you that you correctly told people doesn't happen. That's the test of a prophet. I'm reading back through Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Jeremiah twice called out a prophet, God told him to, who was saying, peace, peace, when there was no peace. When he was telling the people, don't worry about it. You're fine. You're going to stay in the land. It's those people that were taken out of the land, like Daniel and Ezekiel later. They're the bad guys. We're the good ones. We got to stay in Jerusalem. And God is saying exactly the opposite through the prophets. And the prophets in the, that city were saying, peace, peace. You're not going to, they're not going to come to you. Nebuchadnezzar's not going to come and destroy the city. You're fine. And Jeremiah was going, you're not fine. I hope he's right. But God has said he's not. And then God would send him back and say, you go to that prophet and you tell that prophet, you're going to die within a year because you've been counseling rebellion is what God called it. How would giving them false prophecy of peace be counseling rebellion? Because in the midst of what Jeremiah was telling them, Jeremiah was telling them the words of God and telling them what they needed to be doing, which was repenting. It, it also included leaving the city and going and, and putting yourself in the hands of the captors, which was contrary to popular opinion. But he was telling them to do it to preserve their lives. And if they didn't do that, they were in disobedience to God, which is the definition of rebellion. So these prophets, these false prophets, were counseling rebellion. If you have people today, I'm not going to sit here and tell you this is what you, you know America's going to face exactly and these events are going to happen, but I can sit here and tell you bad times are coming. Be prepared. We need to be giving this message to anyone that we can think of. We need to be telling them the truth about what's going to happen because we don't want them to face this. And if their name is not written in the book of life, that's kind of bottom line. If your name is not written in the book of life, where are you going to end up? Can I pray you out of that? Can I buy you out of that? Can you weasel your way out of that? Can you swim to the shore? No. It's a final destination. There is no intermediary state. There is no place you can get out of. Once you're dead, that's it. The decision is made. And I can't know who is and who isn't. There's no mark. There will be a seal someday. But I don't have that vision. God, I mean, I don't have the, the eyes that see that God does. So all I am to do is spread the seed on all those soils. Remember? The hard soil, the rocky soil, whatever. I'm just to cast the seed. Uh, the, the, the gospel is the message. It's not my power. I can't, I can't make a kernel of wheat do anything, but I can put it in the ground. 
I can put it in the environment that God wants it in in order to sprout. And if I don't do it, God can take a bird to eat it and poop it out and it will sprout. <laughs> right? I can be part of that or God will do it without me. That's really what it ultimately comes down to is the blessing I get from participating. Not that I have any power in me. But I do have what I can then give, which is the message. I can share my life. I can share my salvation. I can tell them about it. I can warn them of this. Many people will say, don't give them the negative message. There's no use in a good message if there's not some bad news that they can avoid. And Jesus did talk about hell more than he talked about heaven. This is reality, folks. And that's not even hell. Hell, this is worse. Well, I say it's worse. It's another destination, so I assume it's worse. There's a holding place now. There's a final destination later. We need to stop. Um, okay. Yes. And only God knows the heart of all of us. Right. So don't assume because someone's in church or they speak about God mm-hmm. that they know who he is. Right. right. Absolutely. And we, we're we told so many times, and that's my heart, because I was one of those people. I was a good kid, didn't cause my parents problems, didn't get in trouble, made straight A's literally throughout all my grades. I was that kid, and I was just as unsaved and just as headed to this as anybody. Because I really wasn't all that good, I knew my heart. But I didn't, I didn't do outwardly a lot of bad things. Um, and so my concern, my heart, is mostly towards people like me who are deceived by those actions of going to church or whatever else. It very much concerns me because we do have a tendency to assume or dismiss those people. And that doesn't mean I go around and I doubt everybody's salvation either, but certainly ask questions, share some of this. If they don't know this, that's not an indicator of salvation or not. It, you know, lack of knowledge is not. We've all, we all are there. Right. It, but if they refuse to believe it, Johnny had a conversation, I'll just I'll close with this, with a man he was flying with recently who said that he wasn't a Christian till fairly recently. And there used to be, apparently, um, in their business, there used to be a table, and people could just put, it was like a, a Christian table, people could put books on loan out, or just like passing along. And this guy said, I was miserable, but there's no reason to be, really. He said, I didn't have a whole lot going on. He said, I was miserable, I was unhappy. And he said, I happened to walk by that table one day, and there was a book there by Josh McDowell called More Than a Carpenter. I don't know if you've ever seen the book. It's really little, nothing much to it. For whatever reason, we know it's God. He picked it up, and he read it in one night, read that book, because that's how fast you can read it. And he said, that night, I got down on my knees, and I said, this is the real thing. This is it. This is real. And he shares it with his wife, who is having nothing to do with it. Doesn't want to have anything to do with it. But he gives her the book. And she took the book. But she didn't read the book until she did read the book. And she read it in one night. Called him bawling. I'm telling you, it can be, it, I'm not saying the, that is the gospel. The gospel's in it. The message is that simple. If God is drawing that person and you made that man pick up that book, it can be that. Now, in the process of their conversation, the guy said, you know, I'm intrigued by revelation. I mean, he's just young. He's learning. But he said, I read Genesis, and I kind of like that, but I do believe God's creator. I just don't think it was in a literal six days or seven days, he said. And Johnny just said, okay, well, I don't know that right now that has to be necessarily a salvation issue. Um, but he said, I just would have to, you know, ask you, if you don't believe that, he said, then you're saying that God's not telling you the truth. And he goes, well, I don't think our time is the same as God's time, which is usually the statement or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so I'm telling Johnny, I'm like, but how many other places in Scripture does it refer back? If nothing else, there's one in the law that says we have the seventh day of rest, the Sabbath. That's what God gave. There's, and he says, there's six days of the week. And on the seventh day, God rested, and we are to rest every week, you know, in, in, in remembrance of that and keep it holy, as, as it's talked about in the law. But what he refers to is God making the world in six days. 
So are we supposed to take a thousand years of rest? And that's our Sabbath? Well, we, we will have a thousand, a thousand years. <laughs> but right now, are we supposed to, to live for 6,000 years working and never have a rest and then take us out a thousand years? Because a day is like a thousand years to God. That's what we're usually told, right, in reference. So Johnny made the statement a long time ago when we were teaching some junior high kids. And he said, he said something about Genesis, and if you don't believe it, you know, like it was so critical. And I remember when I first heard that thinking, I just don't know. I believed it, but I just didn't know that it was that critical. And then I started realizing, first verses of this book, you're dismissing, and you're going to believe the rest. Why would I believe anything else God says? Right, right. And he refers back to creation so many times. If he didn't do it that way, well, number one, can my God have brought things into existence in six days? Yes. Yeah. So why would I doubt that he did it that way? When he says he did it that way. It it's really kind of gets to be pretty simple. But we've got the world in our heads. We've got science in our heads, or I say false science in our heads and all. Mm -hmm. So It's in fact a question they asked Benjamin Ben Carson. If he believes in, in creation. creation. Does he? Okay. I don't know, but that doesn't... That makes Riley sense. asked him. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he said, yes. Yeah. Yes. And he says, you really believe Adam and Eve and that in seven days? And he said, yes. Good for mm -hmm. him. Yeah. And it's if we're, we're scoffed and laughed at right. and for, for believing that. Mm -hmm. and, oh, I'm, yeah. yes. There, I'm sure he's derided. And yet, I, have, I was saying to um, somebody who was listening to somebody else. <laughs> I mean, this is like, but this other person had written a book and was writing all this stuff, talking, he, he had worked for NASA, so he's got a science background, and was her uncle, and she highly esteemed him. So when he was doubting the creation account as six days and all of this, I said, okay, if you have a problem with the six days of creation, and then the, the chapter two talks about the creation of man and woman, which is part of the sixth day of creation, and then the third chapter is the fall. Then you have a problem with really all of the rest of the Bible, if, even, if you, even if you can suspend chapter 1, and I'm not going to, but I'm just saying, even when you get to chapter 3, you have a problem. Because the New Testament tells us that it was through sin that death came into the world. Okay? And so, if 1 and 2 didn't happen in the six days... Then you get to chapter 3 where you've got the fall. If you've got millions and millions of years, so I start asking questions. Okay, you believe dinosaurs existed prior to man and all that. What happened to those dinosaurs? No, I go, what do you mean? Did they die? Yeah, I guess they did. Prior to man. Prior to sin. If you have a problem, if you believe that things existed and lived and died prior to Adam coming on the scene, because that's usually the way... Mm -hmm it's talked about in evolutionary talk, then you've got then you believe that death happened prior to sin. There's a whole theology that flies out the window then. Mm -hmm. Because if, as Paul tells us, the first Adam brought death through sin, what did the last Adam do? He abolished that. Okay, so if the first didn't happen, <laughs> then Jesus is actions didn't happen or were ridiculous. Mm -hmm. you got to throw the whole thing out. Mm -hmm. So really it gets down to if you don't believe the first three chapters of Genesis in a very literal sense, you really do have to throw everything else out. Because I can't go through scripture and not see it everywhere in every chapter. Just about every chapter. There's some reference back or some every book there's some reference back. Psalms are full of the creation account. So, I, okay, i got to take that one out. <laughs> Are those verses out? You really start shooting holes through it. you got a real problem, but you really have a theological problem when you take away sin and death. And, if, and so, some of them will go 